Good morning, everybody. Today, we are on the main stem, Roanoke River in Salem, Virginia. And uh, we're going out to Roanoke Darters, Riverweed Darters, uh, Black Tip Jump Rock. I also really want to catch a Big Eye Jump Rock. I don't expect to see any at all. But Big Eye Jump Rock is like literally the only fish in here that I still have yet to catch that isn't a red horse. So, um, yeah, let's get the day started. We're going to be doing some snorkeling, as always, to try and catch these elusive species that you can't really see from sight fishing. So, uh, let's dive on in. Oh, the fish I couldn't catch yesterday. Yeah. Just, you know, subtract five times as many chubs and then you'll get yourself a cutlip that easy. All right, so here is fish number one of the day. The one I tried like to catch literally for two hours yesterday, but failed because of all the chubs. Not as many chubs here, so not as difficult to catch. This is a cutlip's minnow, Exoglossum maxilingua. Different from Exoglossum loray, uh, the tongue-tied minnow. Uh, primarily on the mouth shape, if it can get it to behave, right there. You can see its mouth is, <laughs> it's got two giant lobes with a little chisel in the middle. Uh, this has been hypothesized for excavating the snails out of their shells. It'll go up to the snail and just like clamp down on it and suck the snail out of its shell. So they really need snails and clean habitat to survive. This all, they are also very territorial and uh, they should not ever be kept in an aquarium like you should never put these in an aquarium because when they get in a crowded situation they eat eyeballs so um yeah don't put these in aquariums like ever all right last time i came here to fish here uh snorkel fishing it, i literally spent an hour and a half trying to catch one of these and i didn't so <laughs> i didn't think i would get a good underwater shot so i didn't really get a good underwater shot of catching it so just do this All right, I got a fat caddis fly on here. I think my next goal is a stone roller. I see some, there, I see some schooling around here. A bunch of white shiners too. Got a chub. Oh, that was bound to happen eventually. That's why I was really targeting them. Ah, don't you love it when you talk about a species and you forget to press the record button? All right, we're gonna talk about it again. This is our bluehead chub. Uh, Nokomis leptocephalus. Well, actually, the third time because the first time I had a little watermark on the camera. I didn't see it. But um, this is our bluehead chub. There's two species of chubs in here in Nokomis. Uh, that is bull chub and bluehead chub. Some ways to tell these apart are that bluehead chubs, you can see the tubercle scars on its skull. They are very large and do not occur really posterior of the eye. Whereas on bull chubs, they have a bunch of small tubercles and they occur pretty much all over the head. Another way to tell these apart, my favorite way, is to look at the breast scalation on bluehead chubs. Uh, the breasts will be mostly scaled to almost entirely scaled, whereas on bull chubs, it'll be less than 50% scaled most, most of the time. So that's, that's one way. Another way is that to see where the eyeball is placed on the head. So on bull chubs, the eyeball, the snout length will be much greater than the head length. The snout length is from the tip of the snout to uh, the front of the eyeball, and the head length is from the tip of the snout to the back of the operculum. And on bluehead chubs, the snout length will be uh, less than 50% of the head length, and um, their eye will just be further placed forward. Yep, last few over a little chubber. Go on back. <laughs> oh, a That's a chubber. Don't go. Darter. Heck yeah. Oof. Oh, this fish is so cool. So this is a chain back darter, Persina nevisens. You can see why they call it a chain back. Um, Cause it's back has a bunch of chains on it. It's also a very floppy fish. Uh, the best way I found to get these fish to like pose well for a camera 
is to grab them right on the breast and the nape. But yeah, that's how you get them to like pose well for a camera. Just hold them right, right there. Yeah. Oh, dude, this is my prettiest one yet. So I have caught one prior to this, but it was just, it wasn't as colorful. And uh, this species is actually like, it has a very unique niche in the Roanoke drainage. Like, so you, you can pretty much find in any habitat, whether it be bedrock or cobble or sand, Piedmont or, you know, Villet uh, Valley and Ridge. What it does prefer, it has a very specific preference, and that is wide open. It likes to have a wide open area. So that means like flat sand with no structure around or flat bedrock where I just caught it from there with no structure around. They like, they just like it to be wide and open. They like to see very far. So that's, that's very interesting and unique I found among darters that this one just likes the wide open. So actually when we were doing our Roanoke log perch sampling, I think uh, this was actually rarer than Roanoke log perch. We caught less of these than we did Roanoke log perch. Given we're going after Roanoke log perch, we're really going after all the darters and the drainage. And uh, this is the one we found the least often. Not sure why. Maybe, it cause, maybe it's because they like wide open areas and then you put a net down, they see the net and they just run off. I don't know. I think every fish day I haven't really got a snorkel catch on camera because they're all staying like super far away. I gotta like tilt my neck all the way back to try and like look at them. I gotta dunk my head under them to get the camera under. So uh, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and get better at that today as the day goes on. Uh, I'm just, I'm just kind of amazed on a sec. I'm over the past 24 hours, I have seen so many different species, like, like at least 30 different species. I mean, if I knew Georgia as well as I knew Virginia, like, I would just, I would add so many species in Georgia. I just don't. I'm still learning, still learning Georgia. But those black tip jump rocks down there, there's like 15, 20 of them. Um, I tried using the, the six pound line, the size 22. I think it's a little big for them hook wise and line wise. They picked it up, but as soon as they nipped it up, they would just like let go and just like hover off. But, um, so I think I'm switching to the Tanago. So it's got the light uh, line on it, the yarn, and it's got the really tiny hook. Even though they're kind of big jump rocks, they still have really tiny mouths. So uh, let's try that. One hour later. Oh my gosh, they're probably trying this for like an hour and a half now. Those are stubborn fish. It's like, oh, I tried to hook them a couple times. I, I hooked them with the Tanago. The Tanago is just way too small for them to get stuck with it. And then I tried to hook them with the bigger piece. And they tried to eat that, but like they instantly felt the line and they just spit it out. So I think. I think a size 22 dry fly with like two pound line would be perfect for those, but I don't have a really light line on me. Oh well. I got it. Put the second hook in there. Do your hook hook to get it away. Oh, that's all I'm doing now. 
So I just wanted to pause the video here to emphasize how much of a success catching this fish was. It took me three and a half hours to land one of these boys and over three and a half hours to edit all the footage. But my head was underwater for such prolonged periods of time and the sunlight was so bright and the algae on the stream bottom was covering everything and it was a bright yellow color. That was kind of like messing up my eyesight's color saturation. So every time I stuck my head out of the water, I'd look around and the whole world would just be a bright yellow. Just the same way as like when you stare at the sun and you look around and everything just turns kind of blue. That, that same theory, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> it's a feisty boy. Okay, so as you saw there, this fish is a little big for the Tanago. So I hooked my uh, size 22 dry fly with six pound in this mouth before I walked it over here. But that that is our black tip jump rock, Mazostema cervinus. You can see why they call it a black tip jump rock because it's got very prominent black fins. Oh, I've seen probably like 50 of these today. They're just so hard to, to like convince to bite and get them to bite for long enough that it just stays in their mouth for you just have a hook. But uh, lips are plique, you can see that. Very torpedo shaped like a rusty side sucker. Looks like a torrent sucker. Those also occur in this drainage, but torrent suckers have the two giant black blotches on the caudal peduncle and they don't have these black fins. But you know what else has a black fin down there? Big high jump rock. It even like hovered over the bait for a couple seconds, but it just didn't eat it. So I think we're gonna let this guy go and that's our next target, big eye jump rock. So there's our black tip jump rock, Lizostoma cervinum, or cervinus, literally the typo that will not die because <laughs> it gets published in both ways. But I'm just gonna let it go now. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Um, I spent an hour and a half going after that pair of big eye jump rocks down there. And I spent three and a half hours trying to catch one of those black tips. Finally got one of the black tips to bite. But yeah, those big eye jump rocks, they're just like, just like a black tip jump rock in terms of like difficulty to catch, but um, about 15 times as difficult because there's 15 times less of them. Um, so yep, yeah, that's gonna be the video. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Um, if y'all wanna see the previous installments of this journey into Virginia, you can check out these videos here. But I'll catch you next time.